I'm wandering through the Ryman amidst pretty well every single hero that I ever could considered a hero, and I'm I'm I've got my banjo over my shoulder, and I hear all this bluegrass music coming from inside this dressing room. So I walked in, and man, there was a who's who in that room. Scruggs was playing the banjo. Uh, Stuart Duncan was on the fiddle. I don't know who was playing the bass. Marty was in there. Uh, Steve Warner. There was a bunch of people in there all picking. And Munro was sitting over in the corner listening to all this. And so I walked in with my banjo because I was, I was tuning up to rehearse uh, the brand new church song. And I started, I just jumped in and started playing. Earl threw me a break and I took a pretty good break, I thought. And, uh, tune ended it was an instrumental i don't know what, i don't remember what it was and uh earl and is looking at marty and marty's smiling and looking at earl and uh munro's just off in the over in the corner there sitting and was looking up at the ceiling and earl goes he says he says man john paul that, that banjo sounds great i had a nice uh what did I have then? I can't remember. But I, 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 he, I said, thank you, sir. He, he says, man, step back two or three feet. Let me hear it. So I, I stepped back three, four feet and played a little bit. And he goes, go back a little further. That thing's loud as hell. And played some more. Meanwhile, I didn't realize where I was backing, right? And uh, he says, back up a little bit more. And I was out in the hallway. And somebody closed the door in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I could hear them roaring, laughing in there. And of course, I went back in, and Earl was just killing himself. He was like, "Oh man, I can't believe you did that." I said, "No, I can't believe you did it to me either." <laughs> but yeah, that was. Uh, if they loved you, they pranked you. I'll tell you what. We showed up there, I think the day before for rehearsal, and uh, and Hilda, we picked up Hilda at the airport. She flew in, because this was also, as I said earlier in the last episode, we were all planning after this thing to go over to Sanford, North Carolina at Bill Tripp's studio and cut an album. So here we, we, end, we, sh we show up at this place, you know, and uh, Jerry, Jerry and Tammy and Stephanie are... are you know, kind of pretending that this is, is is a common thing, and they always tried to play it real cool, but there were some points where you just couldn't play it cool. There was just too many people in the room that blew your mind, and like the first person I met, I'm standing on the stage where we're, 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 you know, talking about rehearsals and what's going to happen, and Quincy Jones walks in and walks down the line of all of us and shakes our hands and he stopped and talked to me. He said, you're the boy from Canton, Nova Scotia, right? And I said, yes, sir. I play for Jerry. He said, yeah, we're glad you're here, you know. And he, and he this man, I mean, Quincy Jones is a god. Like, and he was walking through there like none of it mattered, you know. And it was all on his dime that this was being done. And it was just incredible to, to, to meet him. And then, of course, I mean... There were people there like Chet and little little Jimmy Dickens and Monroe, and of course all the hot players. David Greer was playing guitar, uh, uh, Flux, you know, J uh, Jerry Douglas and Stuart Duncan and Pig Robbins. Hargis Robbins was on the piano. Stinson was on the drums. 
Like the house band was just absolutely killer. And uh yeah, it was it was it was insane. It was insane. Vince Gill, uh Patty Loveless, Loretta Lynn, Pam Tillis, uh the 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 Mavericks. Uh and then we started to get into, you know, my ultimate heroes, you know, like Scruggs and Monroe were both there. Carl Perkins was there. Uh, and, of course, the our, my second meeting with this man, and he remembered me, too, was Hal Ketchum. And we ended up singing our number with Hal. We sang uh, Wings of a Snow White Dove on the show with Hal, all gathered around one mic. And they had Stephanie off to the side playing the guitar with no mic and no plug just so she could be on stage, right? Uh, weird. But anyhow, we it was it was absolutely incredible. And so you had me and Bob and Hilda, these three Canadians, wander around this place like we owned the spot. And it was... Uh, we were just... I don't even know. I don't even know how to describe any of this. It was just ridiculous. We were all there and being made to feel like we belonged there and it was no big deal and and I I get put up in this dressing room upstairs and, and the guy says you're sharing a dressing room. I said no problem. And I walk into the room and it's Carl Perkins is standing there with no pants on and Steve Warner and Marty and I don't there was another somebody else in there. I can't remember who right now but I walk in with my luck, my you know, my suit and my instruments and stuff, and and these guys are in there, and I just about crapped. I was like, and the first thing that happened when I walked in that room was Carl looked over at me and said, "Come on in, man, more the merrier." And he and he starts making the joke, you know, about you know dropping your trousers in front of people, and and then come to find out he knew Jerry because Jerry was. In the scene in the fifties, when Carl and Elvis and all Roy Orbison and all these people were working at Sun, Jerry was around there, and they called Carl Daddy Cat. And uh, Jerry, you know, when Jerry walked up to Carl, Carl gave him a big hug. Jerry Sullivan, how you doing, man? You know, and and they and they like he. There was a really unique connection between Jerry and some of these people. And uh, Carl, Carl Perkins turned out to be one of the nicest men that I ever met in this business. He was a saint. The man was a saint. He was a beautiful human being, and he was so humble and unsure of himself, you know, and unaware of just how much he meant to the world of music, and he... He, we spent a lot, a lot of time in the back, at the back door of the Ryman, the stage door where these guys, all these people over the years had walked out of there and went over to Tootsie's and drank after the Opry. And we stood out there, me and him and Bob, he loved Bob, of course, he loved Bob. He just thought Bob was the greatest thing. And, and Carl and Bob were just hanging out for two days. And if I and if I pass Carl in the hallway, where's Bob? I said, Well, he thinks he's out smoking. Well, let's go and have a smoke with him. And and, Car and Carl would take me out, and he he was bumming smokes off us and lights and and we he told me stories that that weekend that just blew my mind about the things that he used to see there because he when his career sort of failed due to Elvis, really that's what happened to Carl. They gave. Carl's biggest single, Blue Suede Shoes, to Elvis. And Carl was buried by it, you know? And uh, so then he went to work for Johnny Cash. So like, so he, he just had this incredible encyclopedia of, of things that he witnessed firsthand, you know? He told us stories about about Patsy Cline, you know, what kind of person she was and what, and the things that she went through, you know, uh, you know, wearing pants on the Opry for the first woman to ever wear pants on the Opry. 
and how much of a stink it caused. And he told me about, you know, seeing Hank Williams, you know, at, out at, he said, he looked at me, he said, he said, three, three people. He, and this was, this kind of freaked me out. He looked at me and he goes, John Paul, there's three people standing right where you're standing. And I, and I, and I was, I was on this little, like the steps were rounded and they went out and I was on the edge of this before stepping into the alley, you know. He goes, there was three people standing right where you're standing is the last time I ever saw them. And, and I said, what? He said, yeah, all Hank Williams and Patsy Klein and Jim Reeves. The, each time I, each one of those people, the last time I ever saw them alive was standing right where you are. And, and he, and he just went in this huge reminiscence, you know, and, uh, God, I wish I could have spent a week with that guy. Holy shit. It was, it was just one of the best things about the weekend. And, uh, then of course, you know, Chet was wandering around. He was there playing with Susie Bogus. They had an album out. Chet caught me in the elevator <laughs> Me and, and little Jimmy Dickens and Chet all get on the elevator down to the stage. And Chet looks over at me and goes, hey, QT, what's going on? And, and he, he, he started calling me the quadruple threat because I could play four instruments really well. And he, hey, QT, what's going on, man? Oh, I'm not do, doing too bad, Mr. Chet. You you doing any picking today? Well, no, I'm, I think I'm just singing harmony with... Uh, Jerry and Tammy and Hal and I are going to sing. And, and he, he stopped and asked me all kinds of questions. And it, he was a, he was a very giving man. He, he, he wasn't, he was interested in people just as much as he was interested in music. And, uh, of course, little Jimmy Dickens was incredible. What a nice man he was. And, uh, I just, I just got to hang out with all these wicked people <clears throat> going upstairs in the top floor of the commissary and they were they were eat they you know we were eating like kings up there and walking I remember walking up the stairs with me and me and Vince Gill and and uh uh Sammy Kershaw walking up the stairs together telling stories about Marty Robbins they were telling me stories about, about him and and uh yeah and yeah, just incredible. Uh, there was one. There was one point where this, they brought this gigantic chocolate cake out for dessert, and Jerry Douglas is a chocolate freak, and he he just about put his whole goddamn face in the cake, and uh, and and Hilda loved it too. So they had that in common. They were joking with each other all weekend about the cake, and uh, yeah. So the first day of re after rehearsal, I mean. It was uh, we were we were just blown away. It, there was there was it was just amazing. There was a lot of music played there that weekend, and uh, it wasn't all on stage. As a matter of fact, probably there was less on stage than there was behind the scenes. And we, uh, I got to pick with everybody, I, uh, and and played in front of a lot of people that just, you know, Chet was around and Marty was up there and like all these guys that I knew from the bluegrass scene anyway. I knew Stuart Duncan well because he'd played fiddle on our records, you know, Jerry and Tammy's records, and we'd been in the studio together several times, and, uh, you know, Roy Husky Jr., and uh, he was playing ba upright bass, and it was just, uh, it, was, it, there was, it was like a festival, it was like a festival almost, you know, there was, there's, I don't know how many dressing rooms there are in the Ryman, a, a ton, and they're on two or three different floors, and there was a there was a jam session going on in every single dressing room, whether it be, I don't know, just it was just everywhere. It was music everywhere, and uh, so <laughs> we uh, we finished the first day of rehearsal, and then you know I remember telling Jerry I said, well, I'm, uh, Hilda and I are going to go stay at another hotel. Bob was going to sleep on the bus to protect it, and the and Jerry and Tammy and Stephanie were all going to stay in the in the sponsored hotel, and 
I remember Jerry, you know, not really liking that much, you know. Oh, you're going to go to a hotel with a woman? And I was like, well, yeah, I am. You know, and of course, it's the whole premarital sex thing, you know, so, or whatever he thought was going to happen. And, uh, I remember do, I remember telling him that and, and it, and it's, it, it was the first time I sort of, it was the first time I sort of stood up to Jerry actually, and just said, you know, no, I'm a grown man. I'm, I'm going to do this other thing and you guys, you're fine. I'll be here in the morning. And, uh, he didn't like it much, I don't think. So, anyhow, Hilda and I went off and to a to a place a place outside of town. I booked and we stayed there and and did our thing. And then we get up the next morning, went back to the hall. So the next morning we get back over there and uh, the same this like the whole thing just starts all over again. Except now it's dress rehearsal in the afternoon and. Uh, just more of the same insanity for another day of music and people, you know, stories and Hilda hooked up with all the girls. You know, she got in the dressing room with uh, uh, Marty Stewart's mom and dad, whose who's names coincidentally were John and Hilda. This is really weird. And uh, got off in the dressing room with Loretta Lynn, Pam Tillis, Patty Loveless and, and Carlene Carter. I think they were all doing a number together, and so Hilda was in there with them. She was like, they're all like a bunch of old hens in there, gossiping and talking and laughing their asses off. And so uh, this is all being filmed, taped, video filmed by by CBS, like the CBS, for broadcast on that on that network uh, at, a, at some later date, and. Uh, so, uh, it was quite a thing, you know, it was, it was obviously very well done and very well choreographed and there wasn't too many second takes because there, there, there was a couple times when they had to do things again because people made mistakes or, or cacked up somehow and started laughing and Vince Gill was emceeing most of the show and he, he was hilarious. He was just hilarious and he made a few bloopers and had to start again because he's just so funny you know and another thing on the show that blew us away was alan jackson walked out that man is about 100 foot tall and he was a basketball player i guess before he got into music he's about nearly seven feet tall and uh he came out pretty well dressed like hank williams the white suit with the black notes all over it and he came out and sang Love Sick Blues, and I just about crapped in my pants. It was the most incredible thing I ever saw, actually, was, was that witnessing that one moment. And if I'm not mistaken, he had, he had some of Williams, Hank Williams' band on stage with him. I think the Steel Player and the Fiddler. I can't remember if there was any of the Drifting Cowboys there, but it was incredible. The whole show, and I was wandering around the auditorium, at different parts, you know, all over the balconies and stuff and watching all this go down. And uh, then it came, of course, our time to sing. And we went out and did our number with with Hal, and it was fantastic. And you can actually see it on YouTube if you search it. And, uh, and then came the end of the show, which was, of course, us leading this entire cast of people uh, in the song called The Brand New Church that Jerry wrote. And uh, I was to take a banjo solo, and Munro was at the other end of the lineup taking a mandolin solo. He's taking the first break, and on and on it goes, right? So there we are, ripping along, and and uh, we get the, we crank her off and get down to Munro's solo, and he took this solo that was absolutely stunning. It just blew me away how good it was, you know, and... And then he stopped at the end of the solo. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute now, wait. And they had to stop the whole goddamn thing because he put us, he stood up and went, wait, wait, wait. And we're all standing there going, what just happened? There's about, I don't know, there's going to be 10 of us across the front of the stage in a line, you know, or more. Turns out Monroe couldn't find his pick. He And he had a pick he didn't like. 
So I had a flat, because I was playing the banjo, I, I took my flat pick and, and gave it to the next person in line, I think it was Carl, to pass this down to Mr. Bill. And it pick went all the way down. And we started off again. And didn't Monroe take the very same solo? Like it, it, like it wasn't exactly, but it was damn near the same solo, and it was brilliant. And it's obviously, the man didn't rehearse shit. He was just, he had, he just had this brain, right? Like it was just, and it was absolutely wondrous solo he took. And uh, of course, and then you know, got through the whole song and massive standing ovation. Everybody's clapping and clapping along. We play out the. We, we, we vamp back into it instrumentally and play it out, and the, t the tape stops rolling, and everybody's, that's a wrap, you know, and as soon as that happened, I, I saw this commotion coming down the line, and it was my pick coming back. Bill sent my pick back to me after taking this wicked solo with it, so I stuck it in my wallet. I still have it today. And uh, so the last time I saw Bill, and this and this was... And he had been seated. They put him on a stool to play. He wasn't, he wasn't really well enough to stand up and play, I guess. And uh, they, he was the last man on that stage. Everyone else cleared out. And I remember looking back out the wings, and he was on the stool. And the floor manager, the producer of the television show, came over and said, uh, Mr. Monroe, that's, uh, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. And, and Bill... Well, so where are we? Where are we? What are we doing now? Where are we going to play now? What's the, what's next? And he didn't know. He didn't know where he was or what or what had just happened. Really, I guess. And he thought the show was still. They thought the show was just starting. I guess. I don't know. But the man said, "No, no, Mister Bill. That's that's it. That's all we're doing. Just the one song." And he said, "No, no." He said, "That's just the one song. Is all we're going to do." And we really appreciate. We're honored, you know. And Father of Bluegrass, and he he led Bill off the stage. He took Bill by the arm and said, let me help you back to the dress. Why, yes, sir. And he, and, and he led Bill off the stage. That's the last time I saw Monroe. And uh, it was really funny that day. We knew that Bill, you know, Bill loved women, and he loved women. And... Uh, so during the day that day, I had gone around to Bill and said, uh, I've got a friend of mine here visiting from Nova Scotia, Canada. And he said, oh, Nova Scotia, Canada. I remember I played in Nova Scotia, you know. And he had actually, he had been in the hospital in Nova Scotia. He took sick when he came up to do the festival and almost died. And uh, so he, uh, he, I said, she, I said, she really, she really wants to meet you. She just loves you. Oh, is that, is that so? You know, he and he was, he, you know, and so we didn't tell Hilda any of this. So I bring Hilda in, me and Bob bring her in, and and Bill sitting in the chair, and I go, Mr. Bill, this is the young lady who wanted to meet you. Oh, is that right? And she stuck her hand out, and instead of shaking her hand, he reached and grabbed her and just muckled her in this big bear hug, pulled her right down on top of him in the chair. She, she scun her arm on the corner of the wall in, and her, she had this heavy purse and that just about hit him right in the sack. And, uh, this was, um, we died laughing. And then, and then he wouldn't really leave her alone very much. He followed her around for about a half an hour. And, uh, but we, we, we really, we pranked her hard. Uh, of course, as you would do, in our position at the time. Uh, so yeah, it was, and I, I have the greatest memories of Bill, you know, Bill was one of a kind. So after that was all over with, um, Hilda and I loaded up, Bob obviously stayed with Jerry cause he had to drive the bus and Hilda and I loaded up in the Oldsmobile and we drove over to North Carolina to cut an album, an album that would become my first real international release and it was called return to the cape and it was a fiddle album of course because i mean hilda was you know one of the world's best accompanists so I, there was no vocals on it it was all fiddle 
and it was a it was a cutting edge record. I didn't I didn't subscribe to the normal way of doing things for in fiddle music, and I and I always took all of my approaches to fiddle fiddle music way over the top, especially with orchestration and stuff. So this album wasn't just piano and fiddle. It had guitars, banjo, mandolin, string sections, basses, percussion, like all, it was a really interesting production. It took about, I don't remember how many days it took, two or three or four days, and we and we had cut it. And, uh, of course, I began to, you know, I was, I'm not even sure how to describe what I was going through. I was, I was unsure of what was really happening for me in this with Jerry at, at this point. I there was a few things that are about to happen that would solidify, you know, would would clarify things a little more than they were. But being around Hilda get, gave me an out. It was an alternative to go back home where I belonged and do potentially do what I really wanted to do, which was something much more difficult, I thought, than than bluegrass gospel music. I wanted to, she made me want to be a fiddler and instrumentalist again. And, of course, we're both single. One thing leads to another, and we seem to get along so famously that I, like, we just, it was a, it was a, it's it's going to be very difficult to accurately describe uh, this part of my life because there was a lot of uh, a, a tremendous amount of of negativity attached to this particular relationship, and but at the same time, it 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 was a catalyst for a, a lot of things, and unfortunately, the the. A lot of it didn't get taken advantage of because of the relationship. And so there was, there we were, you know, cutting this record and she, she was, she was a great musician and seemed to be full of the devil and full of fun and whatever. And I was just tired of, of everything that I was getting from the, from the, you know, from Alabama and my, you know, my, my abandonment issues kicked in and, and my, and, and also my just wanting to have a family. I wanted to, I was missing a unit and I don't necessarily mean children. I just mean I needed my own posse, you know, like the way that my brothers and I were and the way that some of my friends and I were in Alabama and I wanted to have, I wanted to create my own my own world where, 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 you know, things were under my watch and my responsibility. And, and, you know, it's just, it's weird, you know, you're 24 or 25 years old and you, you, you start thinking, well, I got to do, I can't just go through my life alone. Nobody wants to do that. And, uh, so at some point in time over, over the recording of that album, Hilda and I decided that we were going to get married. And uh, we actually went and bought the rings while we were over there. And uh, she picked out her own wedding rings. And I didn't have any money because I didn't get paid yet. So she bought her own rings. And uh, which was, which was a, a symbolic of just how shitty things really were working for Jerry. It was just pathetic how, how much money we were making or not making. And, uh, so that was that. I took her to the airport, and after it was all over, we were there about a week or half a week, something like that, five, six days, and uh, she went home. This was this was in March. We decided we were going to get married in in September of that year, and I went, I went back to Alabama and just and really didn't talk to anybody about it. Uh, something in something in me told me that. When this was all divulged to the Sullivans and the people around there, that wasn't going to be that popular an idea. 
And uh, at the time, Hilda was was working at a dinner theater, and she was not making that much money. She had a little money saved up, four or $5,000, and I, and I said, you should just come down and live here. You can live here, and, uh, you know, this the cost of living is nearly nothing. We can actually afford a house down here. We can do all, and it, and it was true. We could have if if things had panned out differently. But they didn't. I went back to Alabama sort of, uh, I don't know, with a little with a little bit of uh, new life in me. Uh, I I start I was caring less and less about what Stephanie was doing. Because I mean that's tough for any for anybody. I, I mean I I have to I have I I have to pat myself on the back because it really did suck. It was it was a horrible thing to go th you know to to be betrothed to somebody and then all, they just walk away and then they and then they're parading you know everything that they're doing right under your nose and you can't get away from it and you your heart's broken and you're still there at trying to act normal. I mean, it sucked. It was a horrible, it was a horrible headspace. And, you know, I think Stephanie kind of reveled in it because she, she had no control in her life because of her father. And this, this was, this was a part of the same thing that I was doing. I suppose she was finally standing up to to Jerry and and I guess I was part of Jerry because Jerry and I were so close and I don't know it just it was a bad scene and a lot of things began to happen right after that that when we were on that television show uh some really interesting things started to happen the the well the first thing that happened was uh Griggs suddenly decided he was going to try to to make it in Nashville, but I I think he I'm pretty sure at the time he he wasn't going to record secular music. I don't I can't remember. It's a possibility there was some some non gospel music in this thing, but he took us all to he asked me to go play guitar on a demo session. And so we all went up to Nashville and, uh, me and Bob, Bob went with us, I think he just drove up in the car and he and Stephanie and Tammy were in the, Tammy's car. We drove up to Nashville and he had a buddy there. I think they called him flipper of all things. And we ended up in this tiny home studio in Nashville somewhere and we cut three or four songs. We demoed three or four songs. And uh, we had some, you know, some pretty damn good session players come in. We had a pedal steel guy come in. We had a bunch of stuff. And Marty lent me a, Marty lent me a Telecaster, a pink Paisley Telecaster with a B bender in it. So it was an electric guitar with the strap button was actually a lever that stretched the B string up to a C sharp just by pulling the guitar down, it bent the string up on a, it was a roller inside the guitar. Right. And so you could, act, I was actually, you could actually get steel guitar licks on an electric with this thing. And I knew all about them. Marty played, played one. Clarence White's Telecaster has a B bender and a G puller. The G will go up too. There's another thing attached to your belt buckle in the back that stretches the G up as well. So anyhow, I I went in and played electric on this thing and I think some other stuff too, maybe fiddle and mandolin or whatever. And, and it turned out really good. And, and I, and I could see that Griggs was onto something, you know, the guy, he was, he was just starting out and he wasn't polished and he wasn't, you know, a, he didn't have a perfect vocal pitch wise or anything like that, but he just, he just had a thing something and uh we left there pretty on top of the world and uh i'll never forget this and i and i always attributed this to because i myself have 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 experienced something similar to this with my uh, my anxiety disorder uh we were driving home and it, it was a rainstorm and i and 
I don't know what happened in the front, but they were listening to the demo in, the, in their car. I was right behind them. And Griggs basically had a seizure. He, uh, and I think it was all due to anxiety. He, when you're listening to new music like that, I've seen this happen to people. They get so excited about it and so wrapped, their brain is so wrapped into it that they, they have huge physiological anxiety, like explode. And in Griggs's case, he, he had a seizure. He, they say he, he, he peed in the car and started to kind of black out and seize up and he got the car pulled over. But then they had drugged the poor bastard out onto the side of the road in the pouring rain. And he was laying there kind of seizing and I, and I run out and held his hand and we didn't know what to do. We're in the middle of the interstate. And so, but eventually he just sort of came around and we got him back in the car and, and I, and I thought to myself, well, if this is a, I thought two things. Number one, I thought he's just had the world's worst anxiety attack because uh, I've seen it before. I've seen people have terrible physical symptoms from a po from positive anxiety, you know. And or the other thing that went through my head was I hope that this is not a problem. It's the first thing that went into my head was. I hope this is not what Stephanie has to deal with. If if the man is is sick or something and we don't know or whatever, and I was really worried about him for a, quite a while. But to my knowledge, nothing like that ever happened again to, that I know of. And he never mentioned it to me. So this is this is how weird my life was. You know, like I was... I was really good friends with this guy who who had basically, you know, taken off with my fiance. And it, believe me, it gets weirder. <clears throat> It'll be in the next episode. You're really going to get a kick out of this. Uh, so that was the first thing that happened. And then the next thing that occurred was we get this call. Uh, from Waylon. And he's like, okay, we, um, I, I just landed a television series on TNN. And I'd like you guys to close every episode with a, with one of your gospel numbers. And like, we nearly shit. It was like, what? And uh, he's like, he's like, and, Mar and Marty was involved, of course, and but Waylon was calling directly now. He's calling Jerry himself. Why don't you come up? Take it'll take two or three days. You film all, whatever it was. I don't know how many it was. It was quite a few. It was ten or twelve episodes or something. You film all the songs, and you know we're going to edit it. And it's not live or anything. So we'll just it'll all be edited and spliced in after, and and uh, so. Off we went, and uh, and here and Waylon had talked to Jerry, and Waylon said, "I want you to make sure you feature that boy from Canada." And Jerry said, "Yes, sir, I always do. Don't worry about that." And uh, Waylon said, "Good enough." He said, "I want to hear that boy. I want him to step out." And uh, Jerry said, "No problem there." And uh, Jerry stood by his word. Jerry was always, he was never stingy with the limelight. He always, you know, cast as much light as he could on the people that were working with him. Because because he knew, right? If, if, I, if he made me look good, it made him look good. And so we went up there and, and cut these 10 or 12 shows. That I don't remember how many there were, but I ended up singing lead on half of them. And it was a, it was pretty goddamn impressive, actually. When I look back, I've I've since seen some of these things on YouTube, some of those episodes, and and man, I I was a great artist then. I I didn't when I was at the time, I thought I sucked, and I was just like, why am I even here? And 
I was learning and struggling and sponging and just dragging everything into my head I possibly could, all the while trying to just survive my personal life, really. And, you know, anytime we were involved in, you know, doing big shows like that and I was, and I was thrust into the situation with Stephanie, it was, it was incredibly uncomfortable. Because Jerry and Tammy were, a, you know, a bit pissed off at her about what she'd done. And, and I wear my heart on my sleeve. So even though I, you know, was, was, you know, fairly happily moving on with my life, that was still a heartbreak to me. It was still painful. And, uh, but you know what? I channeled it into my music and I think I became a better musician. Because I just poured everything into that. I was like, I'm not going to let this, this is not going to affect my playing or my singing or my development or my learning or my study of what I'm trying to do. And, and man, those, those programs, I was really on fire. And uh, at the time, it didn't occur to me at all. And at the time when I saw them, you know, for the first time on television down there, when they, when they finally aired... I still didn't think, I was like, damn it, I should have done this, I should have done that. I look back at it now and I'm like, man, I was on fire. I I had something there that that could have went places if I, it, you know, if I, if I don't know what, what the if is actually, right? But I'll close with this story. Um, <laughs> uh, Waylon really had some, he really t took to me. And I took to him. He, he was just a guy that, uh, one of my biggest heroes and always had been. And I'm, I'm probably going to end up starting the next episode with, with, with why that is. I've thought about it quite a bit over the last little while. And... I'll never forget one day we were in the in the uh, makeup room and uh I had this massive long mane of hair I had a beautiful head of hair you know they make fun of me now called a mullet but it wasn't really a mullet it was I had just I looked like Jesus you know it was just this massive beautiful mane of blonde hair like way down my back and I kind of looked like, I guess I looked like Marty, I suppose, but I never tried to look like Marty. Marty was always, always like he, he arrived at every gig on the back of a pickup truck at 60 miles an hour and uh, took a bath in Aquanut hairspray, but, and he, we used to laugh about it, right? And, but I, you know, and the makeup lady was, you know, and I had a beard and a full beard, not a butt bushy one, but a nice, you know, kind of a Clint Eastwood beard. And so this, this makeup lady was just having a field day getting me ready. She loved sorting me out, right? And Waylon was sitting right beside me getting his done. And I'm t I, as I've said before, I think earlier in the series, man, Waylon Jennings is one of the best-looking men I ever saw. Holy shit, that guy was good-looking. He was just really good-looking. And they didn't have to do nothing to him. He walked in there looking good. And they'd run his, they'd run a comb through his hair and put it, put his, you know, his, his pie makeup on, and get him all done up, and that would be it. So he was in there with me one day, and we were just talking and, you know, joking back and forth. And I was, he was telling me stories, and I was telling him stories. And he he got done before me, and he he said, well, he said, he, and that's what he he made a joke about it. He's like, well. I guess I'm done first because I was better looking when I walked in here than you. <laughs> and <coughs> I laughed. And then he, I'll never forget this. He came, he kind of not, he kind of pushed the makeup woman out of the way behind me. And he stood behind me and the two hands come down on my shoulders. These big mitts he had, he had huge hands, beautiful hands. The hands of an artist, of a, of a musician, you know. And the two hands come down on the shoulders, and he said, are you ready, boy? I said, well, I'm about as ready as I'm going to get. And he looked in the mirror at me, and he said, I think I'm going to go outside and make some people nervous. 
<laughs> and he turned around and walked away, right? I'm going to go inside and make somebody nervous. That's what he said. And and that was Waylon. Waylon, he knew, he was, it, no mystery in his mind about how famous he was, and he knew he earned it, and he did. And I'm going to get into that in the next episode. But it was it was being around him was amazing and what he was going to do for me after this after this little run we did was even more amazing and a lot of other people that are going to jump into the story again did some things for me that were incredible and I'll never forget it <laughs>